Last night I dreamt of San Pedro, a tropical and an island dream. D and D in my wildest dreams. I like to play some D and D, my Spanish lullaby. Last night I dreamt of the elemental e of the temple of elemental evil. It was a tropical island dream, and I was level thirteen. We were on the fourth floor of the dungeon when I died. Last night I dreamt of the elemental. Wait, damn it! I keep screwing it up. Last night I dreamt of the temple of elemental evil. I died at the level three. I thought I was level thirteen. I never made it past the fireball trap, and now I'm just dead. <laughs> okay. I gotta admit, I have not worked on this song. <laughs> I have not. This is not Lady Gaga. Are you kidding me? Get out of here. Greetings, programs. Lady Gaga. You should know better, Park. Come on now. Hey, everybody. It's your old buddy, Hank Infernail here. Happy Sunday. It's Sunday morning, that special time when it's just like every other day, only it's Sunday morning. How y'all doing? Wow. Well, hi. Um, yeah, I don't know. None of this was scheduled. As you can see, I'm fresh out the, I'm fresh out the boxing ring over here, fresh off the heavy bag over there, throwing some hammers all Sunday morning. That's what I do on Sundays, by the way. But you know, like I go in there and throw hammers all freaking morning. That's what I do. Fresh out the spot, but, uh, I had to come on back. Welcome back to Rune Hammer. I had to jump on here and holler at y'all while this is fresh in my mind, because if you read that headline of this video, the title of this video you know what's up well maybe you don't know what's up i don't know anyway check out that you know that thumbnail speaking volumes bro so anyways fresh out the gym hi everyone welcome to sunday welcome back to rune hammer and the room as it's come to be known yo okay so yeah my title is pretty clickbaity that is not an accident because i got my head blowed up yesterday um from this and i'm gonna save it for a minute so you gotta watch for a few minutes I mean, if you're in the future, you can just fast forward. Somebody's going to timestamp it. But go. here's the background. Okay, yesterday was Philly Greater Area Game Expo out at Oaks, PA. This is the first year that this con has ever freaking existed. So it's kind of cool to get in at the ground floor of a con, right? And I've been saying I'm so tired of cons and everything. And that remains true. I, I got to say, like... The environment of a con is a very strange way to bring people together. It's like putting people in a hangar. Like, we're all like getting fitted for Iron Man suits or some of that. Maybe some people would like that, I suppose. But, you know, like concrete, fluorescent lights. So we had all that going for us. But the vibe of this con since it's the first year was dope. It's not a lot of people, you know. So if you're looking for like a big old crowd to do like your panel or your seminar or whatever, you're looking for a big old crowd to buy a ton of stuff from your vendor booth maybe, we didn't have a huge crowd. We just didn't. It was chill. We were in the chill zone, man. And to quote the great Mark Rebier, what the fuck are you even doing if you're not chilling? You know what I'm saying? So there we were chilling at PageCon yesterday. I did a couple of workshops. I've been doing kind of like this sort of therapy thing. It's like goodwill hunting, only about game mastering. So instead of just talking abstractly about game mastering, I've been talking to individual people about their particular challenges and trying to find solutions for what they're having trouble with in their games. So I did a few hours of that stuff. Um, uh, kind of kicked back, did a little bit of work, you know, drawing work out on the floor, uh, shopped the the local purveyors of goods. And some of them had driven from as far as like Knoxville to sell miniatures, met some cool people. Chill zone, man. It was, it was, it was really nice. I brought my own turkey sandwich, you know, so you don't got to worry about like walking a country mile to get some grub and whatnot. Have my water bottle. None of this plastic water bottle stuff, y'all. We're way past that. Get your water bottle. So it was a good, it was a good con. Good experience, got to say. But, yo, that's just the background. That's what not this video is not about. This video is not about the background. It is about what happened at the end of the day. So I was basically just waiting because I was going to troll Professor Dungeon Master for his seminar, which was at the end of the day. And so I was just kind of, chick, you know, kicking it in a foldable chair. You know what I mean? Talking to people, meeting people and stuff like that. Sign some books. That's always fun. And, uh, yo, who walks up? When I'm almost done with my last seminar of the day, my last workshop, but Frank Menser and like, 
I, I know who this dude is. I mean, you know, he's pretty hard to mistake. He, he's, he stands out, you know what I mean? So he came up about halfway through my thing and sat, sat in on my thing, which was just crazy. You know, I know who this dude is. It's not like, who's this older guy over here? No, I this is like, whoa, what? And you know, I'm not the kind of person who looks at the schedule on a con. Sorry. <laughs> so I had no idea he's going to be kicking around. All right. So my homie rolls up. And I was like, whoa, is he just chilling? No, it turns out he was up next after me to do his little talk. Okay, now, as a little bit of a pretext here, y'all know me. I'm a very, like, you know, I live by the merit of, of now. You know, I live in the present, ever looking forward. You know, I'm not, I don't look back a lot. And so, for that same reason, I don't really, like, put you know, sort of the, the founders and the heroes and the Titans uh, of, of what I am interested in and what I do up on these kind of pedestals. I absolutely respect the hell out of them. Don't, don't make a mistake on that one, but it's not like I think about them and like, you know, kind of freak out over them and stuff, get starstruck and stuff like that. So I don't really seek out, you know, hearing these kinds of things. It just so happened that Frank rolled up and just sat down and started doing his talk, you know? So normally I kind of wouldn't go to this. I got to be totally honest, but yo, Frank was dope. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about him a little bit and talk about the experience of chit chatting with him. There was maybe 15 of us sitting in these foldable chairs, talking with Frank Mincer, like kind of crazy. Right. And so he, he did, you know, it was just basically an ask me anything kind of session and people were asking some some great stuff. Um, I asked him about the blend of science fiction and fantasy. And, you know, he talked about, you know, just how he came from the Titan era, which he described as like Clark Asimov and Heinlein. And I was just like, oh, this guy is such a savage. I love it. Like, that's my that's my stuff. You know what he called, you know, the giants of of 60s and 70s sci fi. And so he's me and him are already coming from a similar like literary language. And to him, you know, sci-fi and and fantasy just blend seamlessly. But, you know, he's kind of making funny jokes about how Gygax like never liked that. But Dave Arneson was really into that and freely played around with that. He had a really cool answer to one question that was like, what's your favorite monster? You've been playing D&D &D for 50 years. You know, what? what's your favorite monster? And his answer was skeleton. And like, you guys know me, like skeletons are my absolute meat and taters, bread and butter. But his answer was so dope because he just, you know, it's not just like, hey, I'm some old guy who did D&D &D back in the day. This is like an advanced intellectual at the height of, of what you could be, you know? And so he's like, my favorite monster is a skeleton because it's basically the most simplistic, iconic representation of like the thing that should not be. It, it is a person that that should not be moving around. There's no tendons connecting the bones. You know, there's, and the skull is like a universal symbol of fantasy and of horror and science fiction, all wrapped into a single icon or, or, or sort of symbol. And the skeleton is the fundamental confrontation of, of the sort of the normal against the abnormal. And like everything else spawns from the idea of a skeleton, you know, and just, I love that answer so much because I've always absolutely loved skeletons. It's just so fundamental. And then, you know, he kind of goes back to skeletons go back to the, you know, like the claymation science fiction era and, you know, the origin of like sort of Victorian horror or like nightgown horror. Those of you who know, like this kind of stuff, 60s horror, very into, you know, floating sheet ghosts and skeletons being foundational. And just his answer was just so complete and just so sick. And he kept doing this one question after the next. And so it was it was really dope. Um, so, uh, through various discussions, we're kind of talking about sort of his pedigree and then he gets to this reveal. Now space spiff over here wants to just get the material and move on to the next YouTube video <laughs> coming in on 10 minutes of making you wait. <laughs> so anyway, without further ado, basically he's talking something about his, his pedigree, right? And one of his, he has two huge, huge uh contributions that are just widely known he has many many more contributions like needle and other cool modules and was also the the main editor and voice of gygax for quite a while for about six years at tsr tsr is still my favorite D, D era 
and not because it's in the past. Just I just like the vibe they were putting out. And he's kind of talking about his pedigree a little bit. He is one of the primary authors and inventors of the Temple of Elemental Evil. Um, and so somehow we're talking about that. And he just kind of, he just sort of ploops on the table, just a little bloop, bloop just a little beep, pops it out that there's going to be a sequel for the Temple of Elemental Evil called The Prison of Elemental Evil. And it is a sort of a campaign setting slash adventure much like this format here, which back in the day, this was a really big module to buy. Um, like, how, how big is this guy? <clears throat> Hang on. Bear with me now. Okay, about 130 pages plus maps. You know, and back in the day, that was a hefty module. So Prison of Elemental Evil is going to be the sequel to the Temple of Elemental Evil. And... Uh, this is like happening. Um, yeah, I don't know, Park. There might already there's. I mean, the blah of elemental evil is such a sort of foundational word combo. I'm sure there are products that exist out there that with this notion. Um, but yeah, the, he. This is like a thing that's going to appear that we're going to be able to enjoy. Now, I have always been a huge fan of Temple of Elemental Evil. I don't think it's something you necessarily want to just play exactly as it's written. It's daunting. If you can, you get a like a D and D Girl Scout badge for that because you are dope. Your resilience is amazing. But you know, this announcement is exciting for me as like a you know, like I was saying, you're sort of on the spot, Kermit the Fur Nail over here. Just like this. I'm a news reporter at this moment, so I didn't see this on the internet or anything like that. I didn't see get some kind of preview, no Kickstarter or whatever. Just old Frank Mentzer hanging out, telling us there's a sequel coming. <laughs> I'm just like sick. But so fun. That's really what I learned yesterday. It was great. But really, the main message is that I was really surprised by how dope it was to talk with Frank. Um, I'm just not the kind of person that, you know, that gets wound up about talking to a sort of a hero. You know what I mean? It just isn't in my my makeup, no shade on it. I'm not saying like it's bad or something. It's just not something that like, you know, moves me or like gets me moving or gets me going somewhere. This just happened by chance, but I was really surprised. Like I, I was really digging what he was laying down. You know, sometimes I, I, I give a little bit of a hard time to, you know, the talking about the old school and the classic stuff a little too much. And, you know, Frank didn't have any of that. Uh, some, uh, one great question was asked of him, you know, what do you think about the difference between the old school and fifth edition D and D, right? This is on everybody's mind. Let's face it. This guy knows everything. This guy started playing in Philly in 73. Like this guy knows what's up. He has been on the entire journey. So his thoughts on this contrast and this difference, you're not going to get better thoughts, <laughs> you know? And since Frank is a really well-spoken, gentle, intellectual dude, it comes through really tight, you know? So what's his answer? It was great. He basically said, fifth edition, you, you can't just necessarily look away from it because it's the common tongue of D&D of today. So think what you may or may not think about it or like or don't like. Maybe you don't like the art or maybe you don't like the book format or whatever. That, that's all your, that's completely your right to have your opinions about it. But we all do need to acknowledge it's the common tongue. And I like the word common tongue because it doesn't lift up the edition or push it down. It's just the most widely known language of how do you play D&D &D exactly? Well, grab a D20, bro. You know, we're maybe going to roll a little bit of damage. You know, we're going to beat some numbers. I mean, that, that's that, that common language, right? And then you can get different levels of detail depending on the fluidity or the fluency, I should say, in that language. And he kind of said, now, granted, they're not necessarily sort of the same experience. And he kind of went into this interesting explanation that really the original sort of what's now called old school or especially AD&D was born of wargaming. And wargaming needs very explicit rules organized by function so that adjudication can be done for PvP, right? And, and that was a thing that occurred. But for Frank's opinion, that kind of leaned away a little bit from what he saw as the deeper value of what role-playing was as an innovation. 
And so he kind of planted his flag a little more in the Dave Arneson group, which was he described how they would generally play D&D with Dave Arneson, which was a, a two to 10 second negotiation on what the odds of a success successful role would be and then tumble a die. So it's like, can I jump over this ditch full of lava? And Dave says, you got a 50, 50 chance. And the player says, come on, dude. You know, I got Elvin boots and he's like, all right, you got a 65% chance. So beat like a 12 on a D 20, something like that. Okay. Done. Roll it. Moving on. Because the focus wasn't on all that. It was on role playing and social constructs. And so what Frank was saying is like the, the, some of the combat detail of fifth edition to him is a distraction from what he sees as the core innovation of role playing as opposed to wargaming and like super dope um really an in-depth answer that doesn't really lift up or push anyone down and then he kind of finished it with a little bit of a a, a bit of humor saying like i don't really want to spend an hour you know fighting a couple of goblins because the detail is so interesting in his mind you know the interesting stuff is outside of that and so, okay, great, 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 great answer, dude. And then a following question. And the last one I want to talk about is someone asked about high level play and it was so sick. What Frank said, he was like, high level play is its own beast. And here are my tips of how to do it. No one in the world really has done as much high level play as I have. And I'm just like this, this, this savage, this guy is rolling up so tough. I love this guy. Uh, Finlay, sorry if you missed it. Someone can post the fundamental reveal in the comments. So his tips for high level play are one, start everyone at high level. Don't work your way up because you will be fatigued and over. It'll be a slog and an overly complex heap. Start them at like level 15. Then he said, go ahead and just make mistakes as you try to do this, as you try to do high level play, because it's its own kind of thing. And then the final one, and this is where Frank brings the knowledge down, and it was so cool. He just said, to do high-level play, the GM can't think in terms of impediments. There almost are no impediments to high-level characters. They turn invisible. They fly everywhere. They heal themselves endlessly. They even cast spells to artificially regenerate spellcasting. They have items coming out the wazoo. They have potions in pocket dimensions impediments are not interesting to them. And so as a GM, you no longer get to lean on this foundational technique of impediments, which are usually tactical impediments. So what, what is it then? And then he's going into, well, you're going to get into social constructs that have complicated resolutions, such as army breaking out for unjust reasons, foes who aren't enemies who are actually victims, Mighty destructive forces that can't be stopped and need to be resolved, not just stopped. And just the idea of a game that isn't based on impediments or blockades or blockages or is so interesting and so cool. And just the way he locked it down, it's not just what he was saying. It was the way that he was a, just a very well-spoken individual. I just like, fuck yeah, man. I love this dude. <laughs> Straight up. I didn't come in there thinking that. I, I didn't have really any expectations, so it was really dope. So yeah, for those who came in late, it does sound like there's going to be a sequel to the Temple of Elemental Evil called the Prison of Elemental Evil. And, you know, Frank had some neat stuff to say about he's, he doesn't really do stuff for money, you know, because he's really old at this point, you know, and it, it was never really about money for him. And so that's why he's always been a little bit on the poor side. You know, I, this is wisdom, man. It's like your elders talking. I'm listening. And so at this point, he doesn't really have a reason to do, um, you know, prison of elemental evil for some kind of monetary gain. It's more just, you know, it's a, it's a shave and a haircut. It's a bow on the present. It's a cherry on top as far as his amazing journey with D&D. You know, this is someone who has seen the entire spectrum, the, the whole thing from beginning to today. Um, so it was a really great experience. I had a really good time uh, checking that out. And, uh, and then right afterwards, uh, Dan, and it was funny cause Dan was like a little bit late. So he came hustling up, but the previous Friday afternoon, he had already spent like an hour just talking with Frank and stuff. So we both got our, we both got our Frank on 
at PageCon. And real quick, I need to send a shout out to my man, Jared, uh, working the PA, um, Ron and Jen, who hosted the con. You guys are super dope. Thank you. My man, Adam over there, Order of the Amber Die, was running the coolest, huge eight-player Pathfinder thing for eight hours straight. Friggin' awesome. It looks so cool over there. Still, I think, a difficult venue for me to play, like an in-depth game with all the lights and the people and everything. But props out to you. And, of course, to everybody um, that I met. You know, you got F uh, Efren and Ethan, Zach. Um, yo, the the great 3D pin, uh, Scott. Um uh, all you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for hosting a super fun little con, and I'm sure it will go on and and grow and be cool. Um, so uh, Marlo's jumping into the Q and A, which we do on every single stream. We'll do a do a quick one, but I got a whole day ahead of me, so I can't hang out too long. Um, uh, I don't think Frank really talked necessarily about game design so much as. You know, I didn't want to, you know, hog his time. So I asked my question about science fiction and fantasy. Um, I, I think his his principles of game design uh, sort of came through in his in his overall philosophy and statements. You know, which is that he's he really thinks that the foundational innovation of role playing is not combat simulation, but it is a complicated social construct resolution, right? And this puts him in a certain stance where you're you are going to want to cook down roles into the the uh red box you know not uh ad and d but simpler dnd you're going to want rulings not rules right whereas ad and d is much more like we got a lot of rules well organized here um so wanting to not really get into all that but wanting to mastermind the situations right and so these these situations are complex in a way that it requires buying into with your spirit. It requires role play. And it even requires role play between players to resolve conflicts that are not necessarily based on combat impediments. Now you want combat as a milieu, you know, um, because it's exciting. It's a fun part of almost every story, right? But um, he also made a little bit of a comment that the more that that the games that we play are about things that are more wide reaching than combat, the more we'll see a good mixture of genders in role playing. And I, I totally agree with him there. I do think it's a bit of a stereotype, but I do think, you know, a lot of role playing right now is male. Wargaming is very male, less so than in the past for sure. But I think that the more that it opens up conceptually, the more it becomes a more mixed crowd. And I think that's great. And he had a fun vision of things. He said, I don't think we've really seen what role playing can be because it's still sort of in the afterglow of wargaming. I would give it another 30 to 50 years, is what he said. <laughs> My man, like living on the geologic DD time scale, like, yo, Frank Menser's dope. <laughs> Straight up. Um, B Hall has a question here. Oh, but it's off topic. Okay. I'm starting a YouTube channel for DD and I find it hard to be comfortable in a camera. Well, there are no tricks and tips. There are, there are none. I, I cannot help you. You just exposure therapy, I guess, would be my advice. Just do it. Just do it. I mean, I don't know why you're starting a YouTube channel if you're not comfortable in front of a camera. Those things are a little bit in conflict. So, like, resolve one of those things. <laughs> hey, milieu is a great word. Don't be funning on me. So, yeah, it was it was really great. Um, really great talking with frank yesterday and really eye-opening and and just pleasant just pleasant straight up pleasant and it was great even when uh, i was interacting with him for my question he's like by the way i really enjoyed your seminar just before i came on it was really interesting great job i was just like oh my god <laughs> yeah i'm somebody man frank menzer's looking at my rune hammer t-shirt right now <laughs> how sick is that like man just like Muse would say, glaciers melting in the dead of night. You know what I'm saying? All right, uh, Michael. Oh, wait, we got E over here. Temple of uh, Temple of Elemental Evil fits into everything, E. Everything. If you don't have this little relic right here, this little gem, get it. No matter what you may think of it, get it and read it. And then form your own thoughts and take what you like or throw away everything, whatever. But I would consider this, you know, foundational study material for uh, an advanced GM. Absolutely. 
is it right for your game? Oh, that depends on so many factors, but it's dope and it's very pure in its mindset. It, there's a, there's a lot of fun to discover with it. And it's really easy. If you just do a Google search on, search on Frank, you'll see his bibliography right there and you can read all his stuff. Um, uh, Michael coming in with a question. I love that you're opening your brick and mortar. Thanks, man. Any advice to my friend who has wanted to open a gaming bar with similar ideas? First steps. I mean, if you want to email me, by all means. Hey, Michael, I recognize your name. What's up? Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot to talk and think about when it comes to that. So I would take that one offline. Feel free to email me and let's talk about it. It depends on so many factors. <laughs> Um, yo, Black City Games, uh, Knoxville was showing up with a few vendors in the vendor hall. Um, one guy with a great selection of boxed miniatures, which I hooked up with. And then another guy, a master of resin printing. I've never seen someone who understands plastic like this guy. So I made friends with that dude. That is my homie right there. Scott, if you're watching this, which would be crazy, um, what's up? But, uh, yeah, love, you know, love to see the peeps from Knoxville, Tenny. What's up? Um, yeah, cool. So I think that probably wraps it up. I didn't want to do a big old thing today. Just coming on to talk about how great that was while it was like really fresh in my mind from yesterday. I got a ton of stuff to do today and tomorrow and the next day and the day after that and the day after that. So love y'all. Have a good Sunday. All right. You know, enjoy yourselves and be good to the world. Make some battle lore for Odin to be proud of us all. Not that he cares what we do or if we live and die, but we can at least draw his attention with mighty deeds. All right. So join me doing that. I will see you guys on the internet. Until next time, I'm Hank Inferno. This is Runehammer. Take it easy. Later. <laughs>